senior producer at the Edge Picture Company. We are a, an agency that produces corporate video film uh, for learning, for leadership, for change, for all that kind of thing, for major corporations. My current, there are a lot of us, and my current uh, list of projects includes PwC, BT, HSBC, Network Rail, you know, big names, and we're doing substantial projects with them, uh, primarily delivering videos, but also delivering learning and e-learning and things like that. Um, just to get the boasting out of the way, uh, there is an, an award-giving organization called the New York Film and Television Festivals. Uh, a few years ago, they they announced a new award for their 50th anniversary, which was the International Production Company of the Year. We've won it for the last 14 years in a row. No one else ever has. So um, there'll come a time when we don't, but for the time being, we are officially the best company in the world at the stuff that we do. Um, so, John asked me to talk to you specifically about the some hints and tips about using webcams in order to communicate effectively. So I'm going to spend a few minutes doing that and then move on to the interesting stuff in my mind, which is what you talk about when you talk via webcam. Um, so I'll move fairly quickly. Please um, shout or interrupt or something if you have any questions. and I'll, I'll try and stop now and then and say, and say, um, say any questions because I'm not very good at that. <laughs> so firstly, how do you do good communication technically using a webcam? So the first thing is to do with cameras. That's me needing a haircut again. Um, the one on the left is a picture taken on a 400 pound Lenovo laptop. The one on the right is a 1200 pound MacBook and they're different. Uh, all webcams are not equal. It is worth getting a good one. And you know you can buy a webcam on Amazon for $60 and it's absolutely fine. It doesn't need, you don't need to have an expensive laptop, but it's worth getting a decent camera because the way you come across is important. And if you're fuzzy and and uh, and not well defined, th that comes across in what you're saying as well as how you're looking. Um, the microphone on a laptop seems to work okay pretty for most people. Uh, should you be using a headset? Uh, I would say no. Uh, in researching this, uh, I've, I, I went through a lot of editions of a, of a nightly news program on the, on the BBC called News Nights, where they interview four or five or six people on their home their home webcams. No one no one had a headset on, so I'm, I'm taking that as guidance from the BBC that you shouldn't use a headset unless you're looking for the fighter pilot look. Um, <laughs> You should be checking that your sound works properly, though. All these tools, WebEx, Zoom, Skype, they all have a way to test your camera and your mic before you start. You absolutely should. You should be recording something, checking the little meters, making sure it's sounding OK. The, the meters should be going at about 70% when you're speaking normally to give you time to be noisier. And uh, But absolutely do it and make sure, it's, make sure it's working right. Right, moving quickly. Um, the room that you choose to, to film in is important because the background says something about you. Um, a lot of people on the news programme are in front of bookshelves. Um, fine. By all means, show off, show off how well read you are. You should maybe check what's on them first because you see, you see some occasional horrors. Um, and I spend a lot of time trying to see what the books are because I'm, because I'm nosy. Um, some of these tools give you a virtual background to use. I recommend that you don't use a virtual background. It never works very well. And it's just you, you're wondering, wondering what people are hiding. There is a way to do it properly. If you do need to hide something, you can invest a, a $50 in a, in a green screen, and then it works great. But if, you, and if you're not going to do that, I, I recommend that you don't. So in the room, uh, lighting is important. You need to be, you need to be well lit. Uh, it shouldn't be too dark. Uh, it shouldn't be too too bright, particularly with a light shining at the camera. Um, this guy is a member of Parliament in the UK, and he's head of the Education Select Committee, and he has a glove puppet of, I think that's Sweep from the Sooty and Sweep show, if, if anyone know, knows what that is. I don't know why he has that on his bookshelves, but it, um, it caught my eye. <laughs> um, lighting is a vaguely technical thing. I want to play you a quick video, which we didn't make. This is from a, a YouTuber called, called Hot and Flashy. I make no comments about that. Uh, so here's a little video which just talks about the best lighting setups. So uh, I hope this all plays for you. Good luck. 
When you're looking for the most flattering light, the best way to do it is to walk around your house with your cell phone, turn the camera around so it's facing you, and just watch your face and the shadows as you move from different lighting situations. So right now I'm faced into kind of a dark corner with light behind me and coming from this direction over here. So as you can see, this side of my face is light, but it's casting a lot of harsher shadows on this side of my face, which is not necessarily going to be the most flattering. So you'll notice as I turn this way towards Towards the window, the light becomes much more flattering, but I'm still getting some pretty big shadows on this side of my face. So this isn't the ideal perfect light, but it's definitely better than what I just showed you. All right, now I'm standing underneath an overhead light. And as you can see, it casts a lot of shadows down. And so again, this is not the most flattering light. Just moving over to here, this is a pretty flattering light because it's not casting any harsh shadows. Now, fortunately, my family room has windows on all three sides. So it makes it easy to have even lighting all around. So ideally, this would be the perfect room to do my FaceTime calls or my video conferencing yeah. calls. Um, I should say I'm not following her advice. Um, the, my, my window is over there and you can see I'm side lit, but pff, life's too short. Um, where do you put the laptop? Uh, you need to position it with a camera at eye level. So my, my laptop is sitting on the on an upturned IKEA box at the moment to, to bring the camera up. So I'm looking horizontally at, at, at the camera. It's not looking up my nose like like this guy. It's not looking down. Uh, it's not looking on the top of my head. It's at eye level because that looks the best. Um, don't sit too close. Uh, laptop cameras are quite wide angle, so they accentuate horizontal uh, ver the distance when you're close in. It looks like you're reflection in the back of a spoon. Um, so, so that's it. You have a, you're in a room with decent lighting. You're, you're pointing the right way. The camera is at the right level and you're using a laptop, which has got a decent camera or a webcam. So you're ready to start talking. Uh, when you're talking, just last point, look at the camera, look at the camera. I'm not doing it. Uh, look at the camera and not the screen. It's a really hard thing to force yourself to do. This guy on the BBC was not doing it. So that's the beginning of that simple section. Um, does anyone have any questions before I move on to the interesting stuff? Good, it's, it's all pretty straightforward. There's, um, there's nothing very exciting about any of it. So what should you talk about? You're, this, this thing is called the isolated leader. You're, you're leading. And I know last week John was talking about values and, and embedding values in the business and how to come up with values which stick. Um, what I want to talk about is communicating to drive behavior change, because that's what leaders should do, surely. They should um, champion the right behavior, should empower people and encourage people to behave in a way which makes the values more than just words, or which complies with the requirements, or which isn't respectful, or all these things. Um, leaders should be getting driving, persuading, encouraging people to do the right thing in the workplace. I think that's a really, a really primary, primary job. So how do you, how do you get to change people's behavior? Here's one way. You, you tell people what to do. Um, this is a photograph that I took in a workplace uh, in quite a famous restaurant in London, uh, as it happens. It's a sign on a door, in case you can't read it. It says, do not leave this door open. This door is to be kept locked at all times. It is not to be left open for any reason whatsoever, which I think is pretty clear. I think we all agree that's pretty clear, uh, except that's the photo they actually took. This, photo, this door was, was open. It was propped open into the street. This was a kitchen of a famous restaurant with expensive equipment in, and it was just open to passers-by. So just telling people what to do doesn't really work particularly telling people what not to do. Uh, my boss, Pete Stevenson, comes up with great, uh, great lines, and th th this is one of his lines. Telling people things is overrated. Uh, it, it, it makes the person telling feel good. It doesn't do much for the person being told. So if you can't tell people what to do, then surely you can persuade them. You can rely on their being intelligent people who will understand the value of a good argument and say, okay, that makes sense, I will do what you suggest. Except that view depends on people being 
logical and rational and weighing up the pros and cons and making rational choices being Vulcans. Whereas in fact, most people are impetuous and biased and emotive and making decisions for all kinds of complex reasons that they don't understand. And anyway, giving people information about what the right thing to do does not make them change what they do. That's not just an assertion. This is a quote from an academic paper. Some social psychologists did some research about why changing health, health-related behaviour, particularly dietary behaviour, is difficult. And they said, I'm going to read this, um, it's not that people don't know that they and their family should be eating a healthy diet with more fruit and vegetables. What they say is the host of other things in life get in the way of them doing this. Changing behaviour requires thoughtful work that leads to a deep understanding of the nature of what motivates people and the pressures that act upon them. So telling people what to do doesn't work and trying to have them understand themselves from a logical argument doesn't work. So what does work? Um, okay, this is my last quote. This is from a, a cool marketing guru called Seth Godin. And he said, for most of us, from the first day we're able to remember until the last day we breathe, our actions are primarily, primarily driven by one question. Do people like me do things like this? The normative power of culture, as in what people like me do, is what actually makes people want to fit in and do what most people do. There will be people who don't. There'll be people who, who want to go against the grain. But most people want to fit in. And if this is what people do, then this is what they'll do as well. And how do we learn what people like me do? We learn it from stories. Stories that people tell about what they've done and what the results have been and how it felt and how it worked. Stories are what drive behavior. Now, if you ask a, a neuroscientist, or particularly one called Jeff Zacks from the Department of Psych Psychological and Brain Sciences at Washington University, he'll tell you that stories get encoded in the brain as event models. And when you are faced with an unfamiliar situation, you, you look for an event model which best fits it, and you use it to predict the outcome. And amazingly, as far as he can tell, as far as they can tell from fMRI scanning, there is no difference between the way a lived experience is encoded as an event model and the way a story you hear is, uh, is encoded. The encoding is the same. Stories work the same way as experience. And as you'll know from your own experience, the more emotional the experience is or the story is, the harder, more strongly it encodes and embeds and more easy it is, is to recall. That's a very, very much shortened version of a very long seminar that, the, that my boss gives called Psychology of Film and Learning. It's interesting. But the short takeaway from it is that if there's one thing you should do as a leader, whether isolated or not, to bed in values, to change behavior, to, to make people do the right thing, it's to tell stories and enable the telling of stories, human emotive stories from passionate people talking about the impact on them of doing the right thing. So as a very small example of that, I want to play one more video. This is something which we made. Um, we didn't make this under pandemic uh, conditions. Uh, Lauren here was wearing masks before it was cool. Um, but we could have done. This is a film we made as part of a series of day in the life stories about apprentices at British Telecoms, a, a BT. Um, there was no professional filming involved. I never met her. Uh, we interviewed her on, over the phone. She recorded her audio on her smartphone, sent it to us. And then she went off and recorded all the video that you're about to see on her smartphone, sent it to us, um, um, uh, uh, and we made the film. So it's very short, it's, it's, a, it's, it's less than two minutes, and it's a day in the life of, of an apprentice, and it's designed to persuade other people to, to join the apprenticeship scheme. My name's Lauren Seister, I'm an apprentice with BT Fleet in Leicester, and I'm an apprentice vehicle technician. 
I started on the 30th of August, so two months now. The team have just been brilliant. They've sort of welcomed me in and treated me like another member of the team. I've worked on all sorts of things so far. On my first day, I was given a blown engine, told to take it apart and put it all back together again. So that was a bit of a baptism of fire, but absolutely brilliant learning experience. And then I, I help on vans, trucks, cars, <laughs> a bit of all sorts, really. It's the best thing I've ever done. <laughs> um, everybody who asked me about my job, I recommended they go onto the website and have a look at the opportunities available because I think it's so worth doing. The interview process, the assessment, the whole recruitment process was completely different to anything I'd done before. For a sort of mature student, as it were, or a mature apprentice, for people like me, it was absolutely fantastic because it really gave me the opportunity to show what I'd learned from all the other jobs I'd done. I just tell everyone to get on the website, have a look and apply because <laughs> I, I, I don't think I'll ever look back to be honest. So that's me, that's, that's all, I, all I had to say. Uh, I hope that's been in some ways useful and even possibly interesting uh, and all I have to say now is any questions? Thanks for that Martin, that was, that was really entertaining and interesting. Uh, I have one question. Um, I noticed that both the video clips that you played, both uh, about the one twenty-ish kind of mark. Mm. Do, do you have any view on what makes the ideal sort of length of uh, someone's attention span when they're looking over a screen? Um, there isn't a lot of science about that. There are opinions. Um, attention spans are getting shorter. There is a really brilliant piece of uh, research done by Jacob Nielsen uh, of the usability for Internet Usability Forum. Jacob Nielsen is a pain in the ass in many ways. He's, uh, he, he knows a lot and isn't, isn't afraid to tell you what he knows and tell you that everything, everything you think is wrong. Um, this is really old. It's like 2005. And it's a piece of work called, well, the Internet article about it is called Talking Head Videos Are Boring Online. Um, and he, he has a piece of eye tracking video on there, which shows you how someone is actually watching a video of a talking head. And the attention span is seconds there. You, you are off it and reading the sign behind him and the buttons and the adverts around the page and all that stuff. It's really scary. Um, shorter is always better than longer. Uh, I think 90 seconds is a good target for anything online. Um, there are different circumstances that affect the answer to that question. Uh, we always try and go for short. We, we try and say two minutes is a, is a good good ceiling. We often lose that fight. But um, certainly it's getting shorter. Certainly people's attention span is dropping. Um, but yeah, short, uh, short as you can. I think both of those are decent length. I have to say the hot and flashy video is much longer than that. I just took the centre section of it out. Uh, and uh, I took the centre section of it out because it was boring. But, but, but that part was useful, so that was, so that was all we had. Thank you. Anybody else? Martin, I was having a question. Uh, you said that um, taking into account that stories work as experiences from an encoding perspective, uh, you said that the best way to um, motivate people to change behavior is to t tell stories and enable them to tell stories. How do you link that? to remote working. I mean, the leader can tell a story, share his stories with, with, uh, with the teams. How do you encourage teams to share their stories in this so different context? Um, I think it's partly about a culture where story, stories are valued. Uh, if, um, if you're able to get a situation going where the, the swapping of stories is, is, is a valued way of communicating, then people are more likely to risk it. Um, psychological safety is a big factor here. I don't, have you come across psychological safety? Yeah, it's a fascinating point. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think to tell the story of your own success and failure is quite a vulnerable thing to do. So you have, to, you have to make sure that that's allowed and safe. 
Um, and then it's a matter of, well, we do quite a lot of seeding of this where it doesn't happen by itself. You have to you have to prove prove that it's allowed and valued. So leaders should maybe get, be going out and doing a bit of searching and sourcing of people to to kick it off, and then hope hope that you get some uh, network effect of storytelling. Um, and maybe, that, and maybe communicate on that on the fact that we value sharing stories. Yeah, communicate yeah. even written communication. I mean. Mm, still online but off direct interaction yeah. online and and that bt film you know that was done fully remotely we 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 didn't you know we didn't meet her uh it would be entirely possible to do, do as many of those as you want on you know in covid situations um and people can film themselves people are increasingly filming themselves on, on mobile phones and things so it's the barriers to doing it are disappearing uh it's just a question of the emph the emphasis on it i, th I think is important Martin, another question from me. Um, what trends are you seeing in um, in industries nowadays with regards to uh, sort of digital learning like this? Is is it moving away from e-learning into more of these kind of bite-sized chunks, or are you finding yeah. e-learning still popular? Or? I think the pandemic is meaning that face-to-face -face learning is is rapidly being replaced by by remote learning. I think taking that element out for a moment. Uh, I think generally the old-fashioned e-learn is a model which is largely discredited but still hangs on. Uh, I think more micro-learning, both in video and not in video, is a move for everyone for everyone's better. Um, so we're seeing increasing numbers of taking old courses and making them short bites with video in or just videos or just a few screens or just a downloadable um there is technology technologies coming to our aid the the, the old learning management system uh, has been sort of superseded by a new thing called xapi uh, which is technical and boring but uh, it means that more or less anything can be given the learning credit and it doesn't have to be wrapped up in a scorn package and put in an lms for, for it to work um but i think in general point of need uh the, the trouble with most the trouble with many e-learning particularly compliance learning is that you're training for a rare event so if you train something in week one and expect people to know what to do in week 40 having done something for 20 minutes in week one that seems unlikely it seems unlikely to work that the, the memory decays too quickly um whereas if you make something that's available at the point of need when you have a dilemma in front of you and you need to know what to do and it's quick and bite-sized and, it, and it's someone like me talking to you someone like yourself telling you what they did in, in that situation it's a story about how they dealt with it then you're much more likely to know what to do and have linked to that the templates and forms and risk assessments which you need that seems a better model to me than a catalog of, of learning that you're supposed to do once a year and that's you trained I don't think that's the way people certainly that's not the way millennials work um you know you know if you want to fix your washing machine you go to youtube you find a video and you stop and start it and you train it you, you fix it yourself that way you never go on a training course on how to fix washing machines in the hope that yours is going to break so i think micro learning at the point of need is is certainly the way it's going cool and and with regards to storytelling does it matter if you don't have a story can you make one up is that okay um no i don't think it is i think authenticity is a, is, a, is a very very big factor and um people people can see when it's not true uh, people can see i know i'm sure you've all done training courses with with awful awful scenarios and and role plays with actors speaking lines that they, that they don't believe um we spend a lot of time thinking about what will be credible in the workplace for the people and our favorite piece of feedback is that hearing that someone went away and looked up a character, a fictional character on the staff database because they, they didn't know where he worked. We, we love hearing that and that does happen quite a lot. So I think faking a story, no, I don't think you should fake. Uh, I think there are stories and you do, I think part of it is looking outside the narrow. Um, there are plenty of metaphors for most things and 
you can think about a story from outside work. It's just as valid as a story inside work for most most situations. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe I ask a few questions. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your for your presentation. It was very absolutely uh, interesting. Can, and the question would be: Can storytelling be learned? Can someone dedicate resources in order so so, so that their staff understand how to undertake storytelling or to look for the resources within themselves on how to how to tell stories? Um, maybe. I mean, there may be. There may be valuable training in how to tell a story. Um, I think most people know how to tell a story outside work. Um, most people at a dinner table or in the in the bar or wherever don't have a problem knowing how to how to structure a story. Um, some people are better than others at telling jokes, but but telling a story about something that happened to you seems to be a fairly universal skill if you are comfortable doing so. I think it's. I don't think it's a skill problem. I think it's a cultural problem. If people aren't telling stories at the moment and they're not being enabled or encouraged or permitted to, to do so, and that's a tone from the top thing. If 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 um, the leaders can share stories about their the challenges they overcame to get to where they are now, particularly being honest about well-being or mental health or all, all these kind of things, then you can you can validate people's stories quite easily. Uh, and encourage people to tell stories and share stories w within teams. It doesn't need to be a whole global thing. I think, you know, the sharing lessons learned after a project is uh, is a well-known structure. And if you can make that about the story of what happened in that day when it all went wrong and how we got out of it, then that's a story shared which people will listen to and understand. I don't think it's a very big jump. Um, but it does it does require a certain um, trust trust to be given to to people to share their stories and it, as I say it is vulnerable to do so uh, so you have to be it has to be a safe situation. Mm -hmm.